the King of the Belgians, as Commander-in-Chief of the Belgian forces, made an unconditional surrender on behalf of his troops, in order that useless resistance should not lead to further bloodshed and destruction. The politicians who had left him in Belgium in the left loudly protested against his action from the comparative safety of London. But he can well afford to disregard them. He acted in the interests of the people who did not seek safety in flight, and well they know it. The members of the Belgian Parliament who met at Limoges to denounce the King's decision found themselves too few in number to proceed with any so-called legislation against the monarch. It is very interesting to note the contrast in this case between the men who make war and the men who fight them. The former insisted on beginning armed conflict with Germany and then ran away. The latter stayed to fight, and when they were overwhelmed, without any effective assistance from their allies, they took the only reasonable course which could be taken. And the sufferings which they endured, the sacrifices they made in battle, will stand proof against any cheap reproaches from those who conduct wars from luxury hotels placed at their disposal by foreign governments. The commander of the first French army has been captured, and the number of British and French prisoners taken is at present beyond computation. The same is true of the quantities of war material captured. The casualties inflicted on the enemy have not yet been calculated, but it is certain that they were gigantic. In disorder, despair, and chaos, the British Expeditionary Force has sought to save itself by withdrawing from the continent. But the very attempt has produced British casualties of a shocking magnitude. On Wednesday, 60 British ships engaged in this operation were hit by bombs and 31 were sunk. And today comes the news of still further British losses. Along a strip of land six miles deep, the British are still trying to cover the retreat of their forces across the channel. But the only question is, how many succeed in getting away alive? We have long recognized the fact that the British people have been deceived. But is it not a slightly novel experience to see them being treated as congenital imbeciles? who are psychologically incapable of disbelieving or even doubting any statement, however ridiculous, made by a minister of the crown, as the bloody and battered fragments of what was once the British Expeditionary Force drift back in wreckage to the shores of England. It is not impossible that the public will turn savagely upon the men who have so cruelly and unscrupulously deceived it. At any rate, the bitterest disillusionment will now blend with the fear of invasion, which has, not unreasonably, been growing stronger every day. England has received a psychological shock, which not even the strongest nation could bear. And the fault is very largely that of the warmongers, who educated the people to believe that it would be an easy matter to deal with Hitler. The decisive campaign of the war has been won by Germany, who now commands the English Channel and the North Sea. The French are demoralized beyond repair. And the neutral world is breathlessly asking, what next? It is not little amusing to think of the trumpetings and flourishings with which Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain. He was the man to frighten Hitler. He was the providential leader who was going to lead Britain to victory. Look at him today. Unclean and miserable figure that he is. And contrast his contemptible appearance with the bright hopes that his propagandists aroused in the mind of people foolish enough to believe that this darling of Jewish finance 
could really set the might of National Socialist Germany at naught. The old world is tumbling about the ears of the reactionaries who sought to destroy the new. When Germany declared herself independent of their caprice and threw off the shackles of gold, they resolved upon her destruction. But thanks to God and the Führer, it is not Germany that is confronted with destruction today. The week which has just gone by began with a feeling of tension and suspense. The great offensive against France had been brought to a victorious conclusion. The French had laid down arms and throughout the world, people wondered when the final act, the offensive against British soil, would come. In Germany and many other countries, particularly in England, there was a firm conviction that it would come soon. And that conviction remained. The day and the hour are the Führer's secret. And he has returned in triumph to Berlin amid scenes of unprecedented rejoicing. And we enter into a week that may be even more sensational than any we have yet experienced. The great exodus from Britain is well underway. The rich and affluent are removing themselves and their valuables as fast as they can. Great stretches of the coastline have been evacuated to a depth of 20 miles. Hastily improvised defences are being erected, which are things of papier mache and cardboard in comparison with the Maginot Line and the forts of Liège. The city is quaking, and whilst genuine business has practically come to a standstill in London, speculators are enjoying a brief paradise. There is naturally a strong prejudice in favour of spot cash dealing. None of the sharks wants to take the risk of waiting for settlement there. Whilst the great question of the hour remains as yet, unanswered. This last week has been fertile in one respect. It has produced the most crashing blow that has ever been delivered at Britain's prestige. And that blow, interesting to relate, has been delivered not by the Fuhrer, but by Winston Churchill, the aged satire, whose talent for injuring those who trust him is unique. With the murderous attack by a British naval squadron on the French ships at Oran, Churchill's last claim to be treated as a human being vanishes. The spectacle of the Royal Navy firing on French warships that were not under steam and could not maneuver is the worthy sequel to the criminal attack on the Altmark in Jürgenfjord, an attack, by the way, which has been fully and justly avenged. We have already had something to say about the glorious retreat of the British expeditionary force from Flanders, and we have previously commented, I think, on the fact that Churchill could not or would not muster up more than ten divisions to take part in the Battle of France, although in the World War it had been possible for England to provide 85. But until we had documentary evidence to the contrary, it might have been possible for the Ministry of Information to state, with however little plausibility, that the measure of support which Britain was contributing was in accordance with some sort of agreement between the British and French general staff. Now we know that no such concord existed. On the contrary, the inner history of the relations between the two governments, the two commands, 
is one long story of appeals for help on the French side and callous refusal or evasion on the British. This miserable protégé of Barney Barrow knows better than anybody else in the world the story of the French defeat. He was warned again and again of what would happen. But when patriotic Frenchmen decided that their armies could fight no longer and that it was their duty to save as much of France as they could, the degenerate of Downing Street turned upon men whom he had been lording to the sky and hurled at them reproaches as unjust as they were undignified. He went further and in the futile hope of disturbing the armistice at whatever cost to the French people, he set up a freak French government in London, making a cashiered and disgraced officer, or should we say ex-officer, to be precise, the head of any and all Frenchmen who are prepared to betray their country and follow him. I cannot help remembering how in Henry IV, also, feigned death whilst the combat was raging about him. But when the fighting had ceased, raised his head cautiously and crept over to the prostrate body of Hotspur and then stabbed it in the thigh with his knife. This noble act having been performed, he went off to claim the chief honours of the battle. This evening... I am talking to you about Germany. That is a concept that many of you may have failed to understand. Let me tell you that in Germany there still remains the spirit of unity and the spirit of strength. Let me tell you that here we have a united people who are modest in their wishes. They are not imperialists. They don't want to take what doesn't belong to them. All they want is to live their own simple lives, undisturbed by outside influences. That is the Germany that we know. I can remember when I cast my memory back to 1932 and 1931. I can remember how everything that could be done to stimulate the hatred of England against Germany was done. I remember how my own friend said, what shall we do with this man Hitler? He wants Poland. He wants Czechoslovakia. What shall we do if he wants more than that? Now, it does behove you to think at the moment how much Stalin has taken and how much Stalin wishes. I ask you to remember that in 1939, in August, the only question was that of bringing Danzig back the Reich. No more and no less. What a small problem that was in comparison with those that confront us today. Surely, if only we had had the common sense to agree the German people of Danzig should go back to the Reich, then we might have had peace. We might have avoided 
all the terrible sacrifices of the last five and a half years, we might have avoided the hatred which can only be very gradually repaired. Now I say to you, my English listeners, the trouble is this. Germany, if you like, is not anymore the chief factor in Europe. Germany may be, I may be wrong, I would only say that the German arms have been in many battlefields defeated. But I ask you, how could it ever be possible for England to maintain a front against Soviet Russia unless she had the help? of the German Legion. I speak now personally. I want to talk to you of what I know and what I feel. I have always hoped and believed that in the last resort there would be an alliance, a combat an understanding between England and Germany. Well, at the moment, that seems impossible. Good. If it cannot be, then I can only say that the whole of my work has been in vain. I can only say that I have day in and day out call the attention of the British people to the menace from the East which confronted them. And if they will not hear, if they are determined not to hear, then I can only say the fate which overcomes them in the end will be the fate that they have measured. Well, I cannot say. Well, now this evening we have to discuss rather a difficult question, that of Poland. I know that many of you are sick and tired of the name, but still, Germany will live. No coercion, no oppression, no measures of tyranny that any foreign foe can introduce will shatter Germany. Germany will live because people in Germany have in them the secret of life. Endurance, will, and purpose. And therefore I say to you, in these last words, you may not hear from me again for a few months. I say, Es lebe Deutschland. I have And farewell. <laughs>